All right, here we go. It's time for Stud Stories. We've got the stud. All we need is a story. And now, the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Hey, stud, what is the story? Well, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, we are continuing on in our little series here about the 11 world champions that I was able to wrestle, uh, luckily, uh, during my wrestling career. And so uh, I want to welcome everybody back to another stud story. And uh, this one's going to be about, in my opinion, maybe one of the greatest NWA champions of all time, Harley Race. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, his story, basically, I think is movie material, man. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, Harley had a really tough life. Uh, wow. Amazing what he accomplished. Uh, at, at the, the way his life began for him. Uh, he had polio as a child. He began uh, his wrestling career in my grandfather Roy's territory in Nashville. Uh, and then on, on his way, he, he was there for, I think, a year or maybe more. Uh, really liked his, uh, his time in Tennessee from what he told me and conversations that we, we had. And uh, on his way home, uh, he had a car wreck, man, uh, a really bad car wreck. Uh, and it uh, tore his legs up, uh, especially one leg. And uh, it was so bad that, uh, that they were about to amputate it. And uh, he had a friend that uh, lived in, I think it was Kansas City, hmm. and uh, he was a promoter there. And he had, I think he's the reason that he had talked Harley into coming back home. And Harley uh, uh, had, uh, somebody had somehow found out about Harley's car wreck, and they told this guy about it. And he, instead of, luckily for Harley, Instead of just uh, trying to call and get in touch with him, Harley was, you know, obviously really out of it. Uh, had a terrible. They were about to amputate his leg in the hospital. Whoa, yeah. And uh, you know that would have been the end of Harley Race's career. Oh no doubt. And this guy came from Kansas City, found the hospital, and uh, they were they were putting him under sedation. They were about to cut his leg off, giving up on it. And uh, the guy told him, absolutely not. You don't touch it. I mean, he's, you know, he just demanded. He said, you know, we're going to, you're going to do the best you can do. And we're going to give him every opportunity. And uh, Harley was obviously a fighter from a kid. It's polio. He got through all of that. And wow, he just, uh, he, uh, he, he fought this, fought the battle. And, uh, and he came back and had a, had a tremendous career. And, but uh, early on, it could have been the end of Harley. And it wasn't simply because he was so damn tough, just so damn tough, man. Mm. So, so uh, you know, and uh, he was told well, after the uh, sur after the surgery, they did the best they could do. That uh, you know, he's obviously never going to wrestle again. They uh -huh. said you never wrestle again. I mean, you may luckily be able to walk, uh, you know, but we don't think so. And they gave him a big bad story about you know what little chance he had. Anyway. He turned that into, you know, a total recovery and uh, the rest is pretty much history. Yeah. So he began his first run as an NWA champ on uh, May 24th, 1973. He won the 10 pounds of gold from Dory Funk Jr. in Kansas City, Missouri, which was his home territory. He was born in Missouri. And uh, this this is this is a pure wrestling history story, man. I'll tell you that. Uh, and in that win alone, you know, it said everything about Harley coming back from that leg problem and everything else and, uh, and becoming a world champion. So what many fans and historians are, are probably not aware of is the fact that the NWA's plan was to switch the championship from Dory Funk Jr. to Jack Briscoe. But a very controversial injury, uh, some say, which wasn't real, uh, that happened to Dory Funk Jr. while he was working on his father's ranch in uh, Amarillo, Texas, uh, just days before the belt, uh, uh, you know, was to become Jack Briscoe's. Uh, he notified Sam Muchnick that he had had an accident on his father's ranch. Now, a lot of people don't know anything about this, Dave. Uh, you know, it's it's not common knowledge, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, and and I know. Uh, I know about it basically because it affected me personally as a young wrestler. And I was on my second tour in Australia at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure lots of listeners out there are wondering how the switch of an NWA world title could affect me. So uh, 
And that's kind of why I do these stories, because, you know, a fact is uh, often stranger than fiction, man. And uh, we're going to talk about one of those today. So so the reason Jack Briscoe was going to be the next world champion was based upon the tremendous growth of the Florida Territory and kind of a big shift of power that was going on within the National Wrestling Alliance members in the early 1970s, especially a shift toward the promoters in the South. Never happened before. And uh, so a coalition of owners in the South, Eddie Graham uh, out of Florida, uh, Jim Crockett Sr. out of the Carolinas, uh, my father, Buddy Fuller, and uh, Georgia promoters. And then uh, there was another person involved in this and uh, what was going on. And uh, he wasn't even in America at the time, but that was Jim Barnett, who was still in Australia. And uh, between them, they they amassed enough power to name the next world champion. And they were going to make that champion, Jack Briscoe, out of the Florida Territory. So in January 1973, my father and I were in Australia for the second time in two years. And we were working closely with Jim Barnett, who was the man in Australia for the entire time he was there, which is many years. And uh, me, uh, I was there as a wrestler only, but my father and Jim were actually partners in this year of 1973. So there must have been uh, some problems. I don't know really what was going on, but there must have been some problems between Joy Funk Sr. and Eddie Graham. And those guys had been friends for years that uh, caused Dory Sr. to suddenly not want his son, Dory Jr., to lose the belt to Jack Briscoe. I don't know what that was all about, hmm. but, uh, you know, uh, the few people that are knowledgeable about this, uh, you know, they tell me that uh, that there was something going on there between Junior and Eddie that uh, that made this uh, happen, that the Junior called in and talked to uh, Sam and said, I, I can't work for a while. So I don't know the entire story, and I, and I don't know anyone else out there that really does that I've ever talked to. But I do know that one of the first NWA members to have Jack scheduled to defend his title uh, when he won it was going to be Jim Barnett in Australia. Hmm. And, uh, and, and I know that because I was in Australia at the time. And, uh, and I don't know where the title was supposed to change hands or when it was supposed to happen. That news was never given to NWA members. Nobody ever knew when it was going to happen, who was going to get it. Uh, but I do know that Jack Briscoe was advertised to be coming to Australia toward the end of my tour there in March of 1973. So a couple of days before Jack uh, was to win the belt, uh, like I said, uh, Dory Jr. Uh, called Sam Muchnick, St. Louis, and he notified that he'd had a he'd had an injury on his fa- working on his father's ranch, and uh, and uh, Jack Briscoe was supposed to take the belt and show up in Australia as the champion during this time frame, and that didn't happen. Well, it didn't happen not yet. Let's say okay. So luckily, my father and Jim Barnett had advertised he was coming, but they never advertised he was coming as the champion. So they're going to send Jack anyway to Australia in March of 1973. So in early March of 73, I was brought into the Australian wrestling office and I'm sit down and met with Jim Barnett, my father. And they informed me that since I was an established star in Florida, which I was becoming a pretty big star in Florida in uh, 1973 and late 72, and that Jack was still going to be coming to Australia, that I needed to go back to Florida so that I could help that territory while Jack spent time in Australia. Mm. So I was sent back home a month earlier than scheduled from Australia so that I could go back and uh, beef up the Florida cards a little bit because Jack was not on them. Jack was a huge star in Florida at this Mm -hmm. point. So meanwhile, Dory Jr., he missed a lot of bookings, uh, you know, a lot of matches that were scheduled, and, uh, and they had to wait for him to get well. And when the title finally changed hands to Dory Jr. on May 24th, 1973, in Kansas City, it wasn't Jack Briscoe that won it. Instead, it was it was Harley Race. Uh, <laughs> and it happened to be a title switch in Kansas City, which was the territory of Sam Munchnick and Bob Geico. <laughs> So, you know, there's a little, uh, you know, controversy going on here, you know, and nobody else knew it. I mean, because people didn't know who was supposed to win it, but, uh, you know, those that did. And uh, they, they, I'm sure that they gave them a lot to talk about. 
So this was very controversial, obviously, for those that knew about it, because it seemed like Joey Funk Jr. didn't want his son to lose to Jack Briscoe. And, and I don't know if that was true or not. Uh, and it might have been because Junior was kind of a, he was not a, a re- real heel like most NWA champions were. Mm-hmm. He was, uh, he, he could wrestle and he did a whole lot of wrestling. And he, you know, and uh, Senior might have said, you know, I don't want my heel, my baby face son to lose to another baby face. So, mm-hmm. uh, so I don't know if it was true or not, but I have talked about some of Jack Briscoe's matches with uh, Dory Funk Jr. and how tremendous they were. But uh, so Harley had this short run uh, with the 10 pounds of gold uh, uh, after he got it uh, kind of uh, out of the clear blue. And uh, then he lost it to uh, Jack Briscoe in Houston, Texas, uh, less than two months later. Hmm. After he got it, he kept it for less than two months lost it in Houston, Texas to Jack. Uh, oddly enough, uh, I was one of the few wrestlers that had a world title match with Harley in that little short first run of his as a champion. He had two runs as a champion. First one was less than two months. In fact, I was, like I said, been sent back to America, to Florida, and I wrestled him for the world championship six days after he won it from Dory Jr. <laughs> in Miami Beach. Wow. So one of the few guys to ever wrestle Harley in his first run as world champion. Hmm. So, uh, so I'm going to tackle the Jack Briscoe run uh, soon uh, as NWA champion uh, in an upcoming, and then actually in the, in the next one that's going to be about world um, world champions. Uh, we're going to talk about Jack Briscoe, but I thought this controversy, you know, that that's rarely been discussed, it might be interesting for fans. They don't usually hear about this type of thing. But, so you don't believe Harley Race was intended to beat Dory Funk Jr. for the NWA World Title, but but Jack Briscoe was. Yeah, basically, I, I don't think that that was the choice made by the NWA members, mm-hmm. uh, and everybody expected Jack Briscoe to be the next champion. And uh, then once uh, Junior said he got hurt, uh, then uh, kind of out of the clear blue, why they put it on Harley first before Jack uh, is very questionable. And then the fact that it was in Kansas City in the territory of the guys up north. Uh, what was happening here was the power was kind of shifting within the NWA because the southern territories were on fire. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, uh, they they had a lot more influence when it came to times to, to decide who the champion was going to be. So that's exactly what I believe uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Jack Briscoe was supposed to be the guy, but uh, it got put off on to Harley for a couple of months. And uh, so, you know, stranger things than that have happened when it comes to world championship matches. I can tell you that just to ask a, ask a WWF and some of the other territories around the world that had world champions, you know, you, uh, some strange things could happen when it came to world title matches. So let's talk about what kind of wrestler Harley was as the NWA champion. I mean, he had a great style as a champion. Uh, he could wrestle on the mat, which he was really great at. He, he called these great high spots in the ring while, you know, kept the matches moving and a lot of crisscrossing and uh, moves off the ropes and big bumps. He, he took tremendous bumps, man. And uh, and he was just darn right good at, at brawling, man, just out, out and out just throwing punches and, and having a fight, you know. So basically, <laughs> he could do it all, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, and I already mentioned, that uh, first, uh, my first NWA title shot with him, uh, you know, I had all the rest of my championship matches against him during his run as the NWA champ. Uh, and actually, you know, after that first one, uh, he, then the belt went to Briscoe. It's going to be a long time, uh, you know, before I get that uh, shot at him again. So in his second run, that's when I wrestled Harley Race the most. Uh, we met actually 12 times during my career. Wow for the 10 pounds of gold. Uh, the second of those matches was in St. Louis on January 18th, 1974. It was a world championship match. Uh, we wrestled a, to a time limit draw, one hour time limit draw. Uh, the, and we wrestled the first time in Knoxville, Tennessee on April 28th, 1977. 
And that night we had the all time record crowd in the Coliseum for a sports event, a record that still stands in that building more than 40 years later. And uh, from 19, from April 28th, 1977 to May 24th, 1979, uh, we're going to wrestle six times there for the belt. Uh, four one hour time limit draws. Uh, two times he's going to get disqualified. And uh, obviously that's going to make it impossible for me to win the title. You can't mm -hmm. win it on a disqualification. Yeah. So in uh, 1980, uh, let's break those matches down just to see where we were. Uh, you know, in 1980, we wrestled five more championship matches. This was in the southeastern Pensacola territory. We wrestled twice for the belt in Mobile. We wrestled one time in each of these three cities, Montgomery, Pensacola, and once in Dothan. Uh, and four of those matches were one-hour time limit draws, four out of the five. Mm -hmm. So Harley and I spent a lot of time in the ring together, man. Uh, and uh, one other quick fact about Harley, uh, he had several short switches of the belt in his second run as the NWA world champion. Uh, he had the, the, the NWA started doing these little week, well, you know, about a week, 10 days, real short title switches where he'd go in and stay in a territory for a week. Uh -huh. He'd lose it on the first night. And then the, the guy he lost to, he would beat on the last night before leaving the territory. Hmm. He, lost, he did that twice with Dusty Rhodes. He did it twice in Japan with Baba, Giant Baba. And he did it once with Tommy Rich in the Georgia territory. Wow. That's, that's pretty amazing. Is there one match in particular that comes to mind out of the 12 that you had with the legendary Harley race? Is there one that really stands out? Oh, yeah, there is, man. I mean, uh, gosh, uh, because of a bump, because of one bump, uh, you know, and it was the only match that we ever had that wasn't for the world title out of that. So we actually wrestled 13 times, 12 of them were title matches. And this last match that I'm going to talk about that's the most memorable to me, uh, at the 13th match, and it was a Texas death match in Knoxville, Tennessee. It probably had about 20 falls where, you know, uh, one of us uh, was either counted out or gave up, but I uh, managed to get back to his feet after they had the 30-second rest period and before he, he got counted out to the 10 count. And uh, we were really bloody in this one, man. Uh, you know, Texas death match, it usually required some of that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, we were bleeding. And gosh, I got pictures of some of it, man, down to our tights, both of us, man. I mean, we were, we were a mess. And it probably went close to an hour, man. And a Texas death match. I mean, wow, we gave the fans all we could. So we finally ended up on this match and on the outside of the ring. We were trading punches out there by the announcer's table, which was always slid right up to the apron of the ring. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Harley uh, somehow in that little melee we were having, he got away from me. And they had a big old steel bill that sat on the announcer's table in Knoxville. And there was papers and a few other things out there. And he just scraped all that stuff off, sent them sailing out onto the floor. And uh, and then he nailed me and he kind of rolled me up on that, uh, that table, you know. And then he crawled up on top of the table. And he picked me up while he's standing on top of the table, which I was just horrified at this. I uh -oh. mean, God knows. <laughs> right. Imagine, imagine what that's like. Yeah. He picked me up and he body slammed me on the table with him standing on the table. Holy cow. Two guys your size. I mean, you're you're six nine and how big is Harley? Oh, Harley was about uh, six three, a good six three, <laughs> two hundred and forty to fifty. You know, I mean, <laughs> it was it was a hell. I was just, I was just, I was horrified. Right. You know, when, when we ended up on that table, both of us, I'm like, wow, we're going to get killed here. And uh, and then once he slammed me on the table, then he crawled up on the top rope right above me. Hmm. And, I, and I was still laying on my back across the length of the table. So the table didn't collapse yet? No, the table okay. didn't collapse. He slammed me and the table was still in one piece. Right, okay. And then he just caught, got right on the apron and went right up the turnbuckles to the top rope and turned around and there I was outside the ring laying on the table <laughs> oh right there by. Oh my God. And then he took his hands, man, and he slid them down, slid them down to his side. And boy, here came that dangerous move, man, that he'd, I'd never seen him do anything, the, this big head diving head, but 
anywhere but inside the ring, <laughs> you know. And uh, and he would uh, during in during when he would set you up for that finish, he would slam your suplex you in the middle of the ring. He'd climb up on the top rope. He'd dive off head first, and his head would hit you in the side of your head. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it was basically a diving headbutt from the top rope. Mm-hmm. So when I looked up and I'm laying with my back down on that table, I see him coming. <laughs> he's got his arms through his side, and he's going to headbutt me on that table off the top. Good rope. God. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so he, he's going to finish this Texas death match. That's what it was. So uh, yeah. I'm luckily looking up, and I see him coming, and I just rolled off the table onto the floor. and. Uh, and he went head first through that table. And all you could see of his body was his legs sticking out up in the air. Oh, God. <laughs> it, it was the biggest pop, Dave, I ever heard in my career. Wow. Uh, I think like everybody else in the building, I thought it killed him. God. I, I thought this he's dead. He, he's dead. And, and I crawled back up into the ring, and the referee counted him out out there on the floor. You know, and uh, and then he uh, waited for the bell for the 30 second rest period. And when they rang the bell after the 30 second guest rest period, he counted him out to 10. He, he rung the bell and he raised my hand. <laughs> okay, so, so so where was he? Uh, when, well, when I left the ring, man, I looked back to see where he was and his legs were still sticking out the top of the table. Oh, my God. Unbelievable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy well, cow. You can believe it, man. And, uh, you know, thousands of others saw it, man. And I guarantee you, every one of them that was in that building and saw that bump uh, still talks about it. They'll never forget it, man. Uh, and uh, that that night uh, is why I say he was one of the all time best. Wow. Uh, he was fully committed to his sport. He literally gave his body and soul every time he got in the ring, man. And, and I just love Tarly Race. So, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, I, I hope everybody's enjoyed this stud story. Uh, you know, um, Harley was a, a tremendous, uh, tremendous athlete, a, uh, a tough, as tough a man as it will ever be. Uh, he, he was truly the, the toughest man on God's green earth. You know, and I, I really believe that uh, just as much as he believed it. And uh, <laughs> so I hope everybody enjoyed this story. And uh, please join me for the next one. And it's going to be about the the, the world champion that uh, ended Harley's run as the champ. Uh, and that's the, the great Jack Briscoe. So uh, please join me for the next one about Jack Briscoe.